magnificent mavens of motion sensing maker style electronics programming. It's Professor Gallagher and in this lesson we're going to learn how to detect motion in CircuitPython using the built-in accelerometer in the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit or Express. As Will Smith once sang, let's get jiggy, so that we can, as Devo once sang, try to detect it. The knowledge drop starts now. And now to begin, plug in that Circuit Playground board, Blue Fruit or Express, start up PyCharm. If you're new here, Welcome! You may want to check out the prior lessons in the playlist to see how we got to this point. Now the accelerometer on the CPB is a common accelerometer called the LIS3DH. And that's not a very friendly name, but if you happen to see this name in code, it's referring to this particular and very popular standard low-cost, low-power accelerometer. Now this accelerometer reports motion and orientation along three axes. So you can see in this diagram, the x-axis points left and right, y points front and back, and the z is meant to be sort of through the ceiling and through the floor. That's your vertical axis. And if you look closely, there's a diagram on the board next to the B button to remind you of these directions. Now you don't have to know the details of how this works, but if you're curious, there's a bit of material inside each accelerometer and its motion in a given direction will create a sort of squeeze that produces an electrical charge proportional to the force exerted on it. It's pretty much a gravity detector, although it will also detect more force if jiggled, tossed, tapped, and jostled around. Now this is how we set up our code. First, as we've done in other examples, we need to tell Python, hey, we need a library to work with the accelerometer. Now base Python doesn't know about accelerometers, but we'll just import the Adafruit underscore LIS3DH library, and that'll give us all of the data structures and methods we need to work with this particular accelerometer sensor. Now we're also going to need to import bus IO. We've never done that before, but that's just a library that's going to allow us to set up communication with our accelerometer so we can refer to it in our code. Now these two lines set up the connection to the accelerometer on the circuit playground boards. You can also buy an inexpensive list 3DH accelerometer to wire up to boards like the Raspberry Pi Pico. The setup commands would be slightly different, but the commands to configure the board and to read data from the board would be exactly the same. Now regarding these two lines in the circuit playground boards, the I2C that you see here is pronounced I squared C. It's a communication standard for connecting peripherals to electronics boards. We'll learn more about this in future lecture. We'll actually use this standard to wire up external devices to our board, but the sensor that we're using now is wired directly on the board. There's nothing to wire up, but it still uses this I squared C communication standard. And the bus IO library is used to help us set this object up. These lines simply tell that standard where the connection can be found, then it creates an I squared C object that it can use, and once we create an I squared C object, we use it to create a list 3DH object using the library we just imported. Now those are a lot of geeky sounding terms, don't get intimidated. The most important thing to remember is that these lines act as a sort of software Lego, so whenever you want to work with a built-in accelerometer on a circuit playground, just use these two lines to set things up. Now once we do that, we refer to the variable accelerometer whenever we want to work with the accelerometer in our code. So in the next line, we use the accelerometer's dot range property to set up a range for the accelerometer. I've set the range here to 2G. The G stands for G-force, the amount of the Earth's gravitational force at sea level. This is usually fine if you're trying to detect motion for objects that are normally at rest. If you're expecting more forceful jostles and you need to detect a bigger range of motion, then you can increase this to 4G, 8G, or 16G, and you can experiment on your own to see what works best for your project. Now inside the while true loop is the code we use to constantly get our accelerometer readings. Now to get the reading, we refer to the accelerometer object. We called it accelerometer. We created it up here with the list3dh library and its acceleration property dot acceleration returns the current readings across all three axes X, Y, and Z. Now this comes back as a single tuple. That's a value in parentheses. There are actually three readings, the X, Y, and Z. So it sort of looks like we express colors with three variables inside parentheses separated by commas, but the values for acceleration are different and they're positive and negative and they're floats so that they contain decimals. Now you'll also notice in this line here, to the left of the equal sign, we have three variables, X, comma, Y, comma, Z. This will take that single tuple and extract the three different parts of it into three separate variables that we can use. Now I actually have two print statements here. You'll probably just use one of the two. The first prints three values in a tuple, and as we learned in our light sensor, you can use a tuple to plot values in Moo. Moo will support all three values plotted at the same time, and we'll try this out once we get our code running in PyCharm. Now the second print line is what we're going to use in PyCharm, so we'll comment out the line above it. This prints the three values using an F string, so you're familiar with F strings, but the string format specifier after the colon might be a little unfamiliar. But by saying 6.2 F, we're saying that the value that we print should take up six characters in total. 
if it uses less than that, it will pad the left-hand side of the equation with blank spaces. Now the dot two says the value should be rounded to two decimal places, and the F is used to say, hey, this is a floating point value which can use decimals. Now we chose six for the number of characters because you probably won't have a value larger than 99 or negative 99. That's almost 10 Gs, that'd be pretty gnarly motion. So two values to the left of the decimal, two to the right of the decimal, one for the decimal point, and one for a potential negative sign. Six characters in total. And finally, since the readings can happen super fast in a while true loop, you'll want to slow this down so you can read the printouts. So with that knowledge, let's head back to PyCharm and code this up. And we don't have much code to write, so I'm going to highlight all this and delete it and start from scratch. And I'll put the comment up top that says accelerometer.py, and we'll import board, comma, time, comma, bus IO, which is a built-in, so we don't have to import anything for that. And then the accelerometers library is Adafruit underscore LIS3DH, and look at this, it's not showing up with code completion. You know what that means. To get rid of the red squigglies of anger, we need to import the package into our Python interpreter. So let's head up to the settings, PyCharm menu on Macs, file menu on Windows, and under your project, make sure you're in the Python interpreter. You can click on the plus, and you can type in LIS, L-I-S-3-D-H, one word, press return. And you want this option that's Adafruit Circuit Python, L-I-S-3-D-H, highlight that, click on install package, click on close, and click on OK. And those red squigglies of anger go away. Now there's one other thing we need to do, and that's on our board. We need to import this library on our board, although this library is actually built into the Circuit Playground Express. My students are using the Circuit Playground Bluefruit, so we absolutely need to do this. Express users, nothing's gonna go wrong if you have that extra library in your LIB folder. It's just gonna take up extra space. But let's open the terminal and circ up. And at the percentage prompt, we'll type in circ up space install space Adafruit underscore LIS3DH, press return, and that bad boy is installed in our LIB folder on our CircuitPy board. Nice. It looks like this also installs bus device, but apparently I already had that installed on my LIB folder. So now we can close terminal and continue to code. Now let's enter the code to set up the accelerometer for a circuit playground, Bluefruit or Express. And the first thing we're gonna do is to create this I squared C object. So that's I two C. This is a variable name, but you'll uniformly see this used as the variable name for creating an I two C object. So this essentially creates a, an object that can handle a certain type of communication between the board and its peripherals. By the way, I squared C or I two C stands for two I's and a C, which represents inter-integrated circuit. And then we set this equal to bus io which is one of the libraries we just imported dot capital i2c that should pop up from code completion and we want to go to the i squared c factory so open and close parens and inside for the circuit playground boards we need to pass in two parameters one is board dot and it's accelerometer underscore scl i usually spell accelerometer wrong and i don't know why accelerometer scl is not a choice here but i'm not going to get an error i'm just going to select this option that says accelerometer underscore interrupt and it's an all caps, backspace over interrupt, and I'm going to type in SCL. Comment, I'll do the same thing for the second parameter. It's board dot accelerometer. I'll select interrupt, but backspace over it, and it's underscore SDA. By the way, when we learn about wiring up devices and using this I squared C communication method, we're going to learn that SCL is the clock wire and SDA is the data wire. No need to focus on that now, but you can file it away, and we'll talk more about that in the future. But now that we have this I squared C object set up that handles a special kind of communication, we'll create an LIS3DH object, an accelerometer object with this. So why don't we call our accelerometer accelerometer. Some folks use motion, which is a little bit easier to spell. I actually had to re-record the video because I spelled accelerometer wrong. Hey, I'm a business and tech professor. I'm not an English professor. But I'll call this accelerometer equals Adafruit underscore LIS3DH, which is the library we imported, dot, and with capital LIS, you get a bunch of options in here. We want the LIS3DH underscore I squared C. So we're gonna create this object using the LIS3DH underscore I squared C, and we're gonna pass in two parameters between parentheses. The first one is I2C in lowercase, the thing that we created in the line above, comma, and since this is a sensor on a board, it's not one that's wired up, we need to give it a special address for this. So if you type in address, there's an option in here you can select in code completion, address equals, and what you wanna type in is the number zero, this isn't an O, number zero, lowercase x19. It's a hexadecimal number, again, a detail you don't have to worry about, but if you're wondering what the X is all about, that's it. And again, this stuff looks super geeky, but just know what this does is it sets up the accelerometer on a circuit playground board so you can use it, and it's called accelerometer.
Now just below this, we're going to set up our range. So we're going to type in accelerometer, the object that we just created, dot range is an option, and we'll set this equal to Adafruit underscore LIS3DH. That's the name of the library we read in above, dot, and you get a bunch of different options here for range. I describe this as the range of answers that you can get, and 2G should be fine for most maker applications. Again, if you find that you need to have more variants for one reason or another, you can try out 4G, 8G, or 16G. Then it's time for our while true loop, colon, and indented below this, we're going to say x comma y comma z equals accelerometer dot acceleration. And what this is going to do is it's going to read in the acceleration on the x, y, and z axis. It's going to come as a tuple, so those three numbers would be inside of parentheses, but when we put the three variables on the left-hand side of the equal sign, it unpacks that tuple and puts each of those three values inside the tuple into these three separate variables. Now the first thing I'm going to do down below is put it back in a tuple. I'm going to say print and between parentheses I'm going to put another set of parentheses and x comma y comma z. And the reason that I'm doing this is because this print statement when it has a tuple inside of it can be used in the plotter in Moo. And at the end of this lesson we'll do some Moo plotting. But I actually don't want to use this line when I'm in PyCharm, so I'm going to command slash to comment this line out. And in the line below, we're going to enter another print statement, open and close parens. And this is going to be an F string with open and close double quotes. And inside those double quotes, the string is going to be X colon, and then we're going to pass a variable in with curly braces, then comma Y colon curly braces, comma Z colon curly braces. So all this stuff so far is the string. There are no variables being passed in. But let's go back to this first set of curly braces and we'll enter x colon 6 dot 2 f. Again, x is the variable and after the colon we have our print format specifier and we're gonna have a variable that prints with six characters. We've reserved six characters. So if we don't reach all six, then we'll pad the left hand side with empty spaces. The dot two means two decimal points, and F means we're working with a floating point value, which is a decimal value. Then I'm gonna copy the colon 6.2F, and I'll add a Y variable in the second set of curlies, and then paste this in, and the Z variable in the third set of curlies, and paste this in. And then these results will come through so quickly in the while true loop, we're gonna slow things down. We'll just say time.sleep, and in parentheses pass in 0 0.1. Then let's open the terminal. I need to get into TO, so I'll up arrow, and then I can save and look at this, we're seeing results cruise past. Now look how I've got my board oriented. You can see the very small graphic on the board that shows you the accelerometer axes. So I'm pointing this way and these values show up when the board is flat. So the Z axis is about one G, which is about 9.806 meters per second squared. That's why the value is around 9.8 more or less when it's flat. And the X and Y are about zero because the pressure on the two sides evens out. But as I move my board, watch the results change. So if I tilt the board up in the Y axis, that would be the forward part of the board in this orientation. Watch as I move from zero to around 9.8-ish when I'm completely vertical. And if I tilt back in the other direction, I see the numbers get smaller, then they get negative, And I'm about negative 9.8 when I'm vertical the other way. Similarly, on the X axis, if I tilt left, we see an increase from zero until I reach about 9.8. Then if I move in the other direction, I decrease until I'm around negative 9.8. And the z-axis is interesting. So it's 9.8 when it's flat like this, but when I flip it over completely, it's around negative 9.8. And then if I shake the board, you can see the values go up greater than 1g, greater than 9.8 or negative 9.8. So move your board around and explore how this changes the output from the different readings for the accelerometer axes. But congratulations, you've got an accelerometer working in CircuitPython. So we can now close the terminal window and we can save this as accelerometer.py to our Circuit Playground School folder. And we can close the extra tab. And in fact, what I'm gonna do is highlight all the code on the board and copy it. And I'm gonna quit out of PyCharm and I'm gonna get back into Moo. I unplugged my board and plugged it back in just to make sure that there wasn't any confusion as I get into Moo. And we can see it actually loads up code.py as it was last saved on our board. And I'm going to remove the hashtag comment in front of the print with the tuple, and I'm going to put a hashtag comment in front of the print below it. And don't forget to save. 
and open serial and plotter and look at this the numbers are just whipping past you can see blue is X green is Y and gold is Z and if you move your board around you can see the axes change in different ways so feel free to experiment with this and get a sense of you know, how the different values change as you move your accelerometer and if you shake it around but this is really an amazing thing it's built into the circuit playground boards and you can use this for lots of cool projects and we're about to have a challenge that will challenge you to apply this in something cool and the challenge is the who moved my stuff alarm have you ever had a sibling or roommate who borrowed your stuff when you didn't want them to who went through your stuff when you specifically asked them to keep out well the goal of this challenge is to build the who moved my stuff alarm it should function similar to the fridge alarm but it should detect motion rather than light so when first running the alarm should be off press button a should arm the alarm activating things after five seconds to give you enough time to set the circuit playground on the item that should not be moved without setting off the alarm jostling the circuit playground when device is armed should activate simultaneous red pulsing and siren wave sound play choose a value for the sensor that you think would be best for detecting movement but that won't set off the alarm when say somebody simply walks past the device Pressing button B should turn off the alarm so that it won't keep going off. And just like with the fridge alarm, it's okay to hold the finger down on button B until the cycle sound pulse is done. This way an uninvited snoop won't be able to shut off the alarm so quickly and you can catch the culprit and save your work as who moved my stuff.py. This is how the device should function when it's built properly. So here I am with the Who Moved My Stuff alarm. I'm battery powered on this device and I'm gonna press A to arm the alarm. And then I should be able to wait five seconds. And I have my iPad hooked up to this because my iPad is the subject of uh, a lot of nabbing from other family members. And so what happens if somebody tries to move this? Oh, it goes off. And then I can arm the alarm again by holding down B. And then that we're safe. And if you wanna reset it again, you can wait five seconds. Then we'll see if somebody tries to nab my iPad. Oh, we caught him red-handed. So again, very similar to the um, fridge alarm that you had created, but this time it's gonna detect motion. Good luck. So give this a shot and we'll compare answers in the next lesson. Of course, there was much big learning in this lesson. We learned to set up and use an accelerometer to read three axes of motion and positioning. We learned how to unpack a tuple in our case with three variables, X, Y, and Z. And we learned how to print format specifiers to configure numbers with decimals to show a certain number of decimal values. And as a bonus, we learned to use Moo to plot the three values we got from the accelerometer. I hope that you were successful in tackling the challenge. See you in the next lesson where we'll see how we made something awesome.